Well, good morning. Here we are again, praising the Lord. Uh, thank you for joining us, Discipleship Empowerment Word, again, as we are continuing on our long journey of looking at the word holy, Holy Spirit, and Spirit, and also seeing what other words are connected around to it. And I just want to thank you for joining us this morning. I know it's Sunday. A lot of you will be getting ready for church. Some of you on the other side of the world have gone to church. And depending on what time zone you're in around the world, you may even be in church right now. But whatever you're doing, or this may just be your time of fellowship the today because of maybe shut down or other things that are taking place in the part of the world that you're in. We're keeping all of you in prayer daily often twice daily, thinking about you and praying that in your time, the needs that the Lord will be there. And again, as we've been looking at the last day or so, how Christ is our high priest. Wow. Talk about somebody that is there to intercede on behalf of us during our times of needs, during our times of weaknesses, during our times of challenge. Amen. And he is there. And of course, we have mentioned how the book of Hebrews uh, is trying to explain in great detail the why the high priest, Jesus Christ, is so important today. And again, just not to be a broken record, <laughs> but we have to really get this concept of Christ, our high priest. We, t we think often of Jesus Christ in, in a very narrow way, but I'm trying to expand mm -hmm. You're thinking through other words that define the fullness of his ministry to us. And the great ministry that he did and continues to do is to be our holy high priest. So thank you for joining us. We're going to continue on in Hebrews chapter 9 as we look at these words again. And yesterday we were talking about how... There is the earthly sanctuary, and then there is the earthly service of that high priest, and then there is the heavenly sanctuary, and how in the heavenly sanctuary, our high priest is still serving and still uh, arbitrating, if you want to put it that way, on our behalf. And that, the reason why I use that bigger word, because what's going to come on into Hebrews chapter 9 the latter part of it, he begins to share with us, the author, is that as Christ as our high priest, another, another function of what he's doing is arbitrating on our behalf or being a mediator. Now, there is an interesting thought. Those two words, because when you think of it, when the high priest entered the holy once, uh, once a year, and what was he doing? He was uh, mediating on behalf of the people. And we, the people, need a mediator. And we saw that in verse 15 of chapter 9. Let's just read it again. We ended up there yesterday, but it kind of lays the foundation for what we want to look at and try to see the bigger picture of how this idea of our holy high priest, how he mediates, how he is a testator, and also how this is all comes together because of a covenant that has been made. An agreement, if you want to call that. And so it's kind of a unique chapter here. And I was thinking, boy, I hope I get an opportunity to somewhere in a church to be able to preach this and, and to get people to see the bigger picture. Amen. So when we go to verse 15, it says, and for this reason. So again, he's summing up for this reason, because of the heavenly sanctuary, because of the shedding of the blood of the of our holy high priest uh, on the altar for our redemption. Because of all that, or for this reason, he is our mediator. He is the one who stands in the gap or arbitrates or negotiates or uh, stands as counsel for us. Isn't that amazing? We don't have to do this all alone. 
It's just like, you know, when you get into trouble, the first thing you do is call a lawyer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, when you get into trouble or difficulties or, or challenges that you face, maybe the first thing you need to do is call on Jesus Christ, our high priest, who is our mediator, mediating on behalf of us. So the idea of mediator here is still being connected, still, you know, the author of Hebrews is still building about the sanctuary, about the covenant, about how things were like in the human realm and how they are in the spiritual realm. And then also the same thing when it comes to our defense, because we have been found guilty in trespasses and sins. Remember that? Scripture says we we are born that way. We didn't have to do anything to get there. We already had the the upon our lives and upon our heart the sin nature that we got from Adam and Eve and the only way to be set free from that bondage that imprisonment is to be able to go to our mediator our high priest Jesus Christ who will then as we call out upon him in faith and trust he will mediate for us isn't that wonderful isn't that beautiful to think about that he is mediating on our behalf. <clears throat> so he, what is he mediating? And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant. There is the old covenant, and under the old covenant, we're found guilty. Then the high priest uh, presented through his shed blood, brought about a new covenant, <clears throat> which is in Christ Jesus. And he says, for the new covenant, by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant. See, we were under the first covenant, we were in transgressions. We were still with sin. But it goes on, that those who are called and may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So what is happening now is our high priest, because he fulfilled the price that needed to be paid for sin, the shedding of blood, Jesus did that, the Christ, the anointed one, he could then bring into uh, into being a new covenant. And under this new covenant came the promise that he would then be our mediator and is through him only. Remember, only one high priest or only one person could go into the Holy of Holies once a year and now christ fulfilled that where he as a high priest went into the holy of holy once and once and for all he doesn't do it now every year and and continue to do it no he only offered up his blood once it was enough the price was enough for to bring about a new covenant which was built on the idea of the shedding of the blood and that through faith in Christ, we could then receive the promise, the promise of the forgiveness of sin through Christ. And I believe also the promise of the power of the Holy Spirit to come and fill us and to be with us. So this is what the mediator is doing. <clears throat> but now uh, the author is, is kind of attaching the whole idea of the high priest and now also what goes on in a law court. Uh, because, again, they had a lot of laws. <laughs> uh, the, the Jewish people had a lot of laws. And, and what the Hebrew writer is trying to show that, do you understand the high priest? Yes. Do you understand the lawyer, the mediator? Do you understand these people? You know, they would come before the gate. Or they would come at Moses' time before his tent. And Moses would mediate. Uh, remember Solomon when they uh, two women came and both said, that's my baby. And Solomon, of course, with great wisdom, his purpose at the gate was to be able to mediate on behalf of these two people and come up with a solution. And the solution was binding. Okay. And so... Here, we now have a mediator. So they would understand that, you know, through David, King David, the different kings through the, often the priest, you know, would uh, mediate 
Often the uh, prophets would be mediators on behalf of the people. But all that was being fulfilled. And so we need to, as the Gentiles, who have been come to know Christ as our Lord and Savior, we need to understand the role of the high priest. We need to understand the role of the mediator. Because, you know, uh, not only was the mediator there, but the mediator was there to hear the testimony and to hear what the witnesses would bring. And so that's why Jesus would talk about the two witnesses. Even in the book of Revelation, there are two witnesses that come. Because they will then, as witnesses, they become sworn in, if you, were, if you could think of that in a law court, and that their testimony, you know, it shouldn't just be the testimony of one because the one person could be biased. But the testimony of two or three, the scripture says, that two or three agree on earth, then it is done in heaven. So a, a testimony, do you see all these marvelous things that we just don't get? I get so excited about this section of the scripture because, you know, he's showing us what was going on and what is now happening in the kingdom of heaven. And so this idea of the mediator mediating on behalf of us as sinners you know there's a testimony against us you know we have we have been found guilty of sin and trespasses and other things and we are guilty and without receiving jesus christ's forgiveness and asking him to forgive us to come before him and say yes we are judged we are guilty and then ask him to mediate on behalf of us before the Father, so that when judgment comes down, we will be found not guilty. We will be found uh, in the place that, because of our mediator, we can have eternal life. What a wonderful thought that is, and how precious that is. So as he goes on now, he's going to begin to talk about the mediator, and he's going to bring in uh, another new word so that we, that this doesn't get used a lot in the Bible, but it is used in the law courts. People would understand this. So let's just read these few verses. For where there is a testament, where there is a testimony, somebody is going to now be brought under oath to give a testimony. Okay. Where there is a testament, there must also uh, the, there must also of necessity be a death of the testator. So this testator idea now we've got to understand that he is just brought into the whole idea of eternal inheritance, the 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 death and life through Christ, how he mediates on behalf of us. But now this testator, let's go on. For a testament is in force after the men is, are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator is alive. So what we need to see here is this idea of a testator. Okay, it almost sounds a lot like a person. But to put it in the simple, the simple uh, understanding, it's a will. In a sense, it's a living will. Okay, and so think about this for a few moments so that it, it is not binding yet until the author says here, until the person dies. Many of us in uh, North America and, and uh, Europe and other places have wills, some form of will, something you've written out that after you die that you wish will take place concerning your estate or that which you have. Concerning your stuff, as Colin would call it. The stuff that you're going to leave behind for everybody else to try to figure it all out. Well, there's going to be probably a lawyer involved, not all the time, but sometimes a lawyer involved that will sort out all those details. And sometimes those details can take years to sort out when there's more stuff. But in that document, that testator or that will, it is in there, it is not binding or in effect until the person has died. Then at that moment, it becomes binding, it becomes living, 
and it becomes an effect. L- listen to what uh, the word testator uh, means, a person who has made a will and given a legacy. Think about that. Because what is trying to Hebrews is trying to link this to is to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, while on earth living, there were certain things that could take place. But then his will and testimony, the gospel, the good news, that we are challenged as the disciples to follow is left behind. So a person who has made a will or given a legacy, is that Jesus Christ? Did he make a will? My will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Hmm. Also, it means a person who dies leaving a will or a testament in force. So now, because of the will, those of us who have, uh, I know a lot of you around the other parts of the world may not have wills, but I know uh, that in Myanmar, even in that uh, country, they have wills uh, uh, that are binding, that will take care of different things. And it's interesting, a person who dies leaving a will or testimony in force. And so this will then often is uh, you will have somebody who will sign it. So, so for example, if you write a will, then you need to sign it. But then you usually have to have a couple witnesses. Now it's down to one, but a lot back in the olden days was two witnesses that would witness that that was your signature that was put on the document. And so if anyone would come along and challenge it, no, somebody else wrote this will and just signed his name. And probably in the will, all the stuff would be left to that other person. But at that moment, the two witnesses would stand up and say, no, this is not the will that he signed. We saw the will. We saw the paperwork. We saw him sign it. We saw that it was sealed Isn't that interesting? The same word, the word of the Holy Spirit, that it was sealed. And now that it is sealed and we have signed to it, it is now living and binding, even though the author of the will is dead. And that's what he's trying to bring about here. He's trying to say that, yes, Jesus Christ lived here on earth, but he left behind a will, a testimony. And that's why we have the New Testament. That's why we have a new covenant. Remember the disciples were where? In the upper room or in a room with Jesus before his death. And he then says to him, this bread represents my body. This cup of wine represents my blood, which is the new covenant, the testimony that I'm leaving with you, that when I die, it will become binding in force. There will be no other truth. There will be no other way. There is no other life but Jesus Christ. There is no other way to heaven. People would say, well, how do I get that inheritance? That person left billions of dollars behind. How do I get it? By faith in Jesus Christ. You know, by being part of the testimony. But if your name is not on it, you don't get it. And isn't it interesting that the those who go in to heaven, their names must be found where? In the book of life. The book of life is a testimony of your life and it cannot be changed after your death the testator or the will cannot be changed you cannot rewrite it after the death of the person who has died signed it sealed it and had it witness it it's binding it cannot be changed A lot of people want to change the scripture. They want to change the gospel. They want to say it means something else. Sorry. It cannot happen. It cannot happen. And and, and the author of Hebrew was appealing to the readers. You know a will, a testator, cannot be changed after the person is dead. But 
it is living and binding until it's completely fulfilled. What he's going to fulfill, completely fulfill, is his promises to us, the church. He's going to fulfill his second coming to us. He's fulfilling his kingdom in heaven is being established for us. He's fulfilling being a mediator and a high priest for us. He's fulfilling all that. Why? Because he's bound to fulfill it. Because he left it as his living testimony for those who were left behind. Are you getting that? Even the, the testator or the will is a binding document both for the person who wrote it and for the person who is going to read it and carry out what it says. Now think about that. That Christ has to obey his own word, <laughs> his own writings, his own testimony. That's why it's called a covenant. The word covenant, a synonym for co a synonym for government, is testimony. Wow, think about that. So it is often signed by two witnesses, and the dictionary even says it's legally binding. Even though people go to court and try to fight it and say it's not fair and that, it's legally binding. So he says in verse 17, for a testament is in force after the men, after men is dead, after the men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator is alive. Okay, no power. I, I don't know. <laughs> I know we got to get going through here, but boy, oh boy, there is something that is that is amazing. Jesus dies on the cross. He then arises from the dead. He meets with the people, some of the people, especially the apostles. But he has to ascend in heaven. Why? So that as he goes into the heavens, at that moment, the will comes into effect. And at that moment, that now living will has the power to change the direction of many things. A will in the olden days was very powerful. That's why since he says here, since it has no power at all while the testator is alive. We say, okay, that's true. But we forget the flip side of it, that while he is dead, it has all power. The living will testimony of Jesus Christ has all power. What did Jesus say to the, to the disciples? Go tarry in Jerusalem. Go wait there until you are endued from on high by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's when the testimony, that's when the testator, that's when the will came into full effect. Wow. Isn't that amazing? There's nothing we can do to change it. All we can do is get lined up to the will. And the moment we get lined up to the will and say, Jesus, forgive us of our sins and, and uh, ask you to come into our hearts, at that moment, that's why Jesus said, at that moment, you then become sons and daughters. And at that moment, you become heirs, right? Heirs to what? To the will and testimony. To the testator. Those of you who aren't Christians right now, you don't have any option. You, you have, you're no part of this because your, your name is not found in the book of heaven. The Lamb's book of life. Your name is not found on the testator. But through faith and believing in Jesus Christ, your name then gets added. And when you die, the full effects of what Christ has done will come upon you in power. But not only in the after you die, but here on earth while you live as a king's kid, the also the will and testimony is active in your life. Isn't that an amazing thought? 
We don't get this because we don't understand it. Well, then he goes on. I need to get to the end of the chapter here, and I don't think that's going to happen. But <laughs> he goes on in verse 18. He says, now, therefore, since you understand what the holy high priest is, you understand what a mediator is, you understand what a testator is, you understand the power of the covenant is, well, now that you get all that, the people would have been shaking, yeah, yeah, we get that, yeah, yeah, move on, we got it, we know, we see it all around us all the time. See, they would have seen it. They would have seen the high priest walking down the road. They would have seen when the high priest puts on his garments, the, the holy garments that he was going to be entering in once a year into the holy holies. They would have understood the mediator a lot of times, mediators were sitting out. Do you remember Ruth? What did they do? He had Ruth and Boaz had to do what? Well, not Ruth, but Boaz and his brother, or his, his next akin, had to go to the city gate, share their testimonies, fulfill. Boaz wasn't challenging the law. The law was that Ruth would go to the next akin to um, uh, her husband. But here they go out and they go before, and what do they do? They assemble elders to hear the testimony and mediate on behalf of the two of them. And at the end of it, what do they said? Okay, now that we have heard we can now bear testimony, and now you, Boaz, you take on the estate of Ruth, or Naomi's estate, which also brings in Ruth. All Everything, everything that they were doing was according to the law. And they know this, the Jewish people would know this, and that's why they would keep saying, come on now, keep moving on, because we know this. But Ruth, the book of Ruth is accounting of all of this. You know, our kinsman redeemer. I better stop preaching here. <laughs> we only got a couple of minutes left. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. So here we are with the covenant. The covenants are binding. See, back in the olden days, I used to do a lot of history study. And even land deeds and things like that were sealed in blood. That sounds gory. But I've seen lots of documents when people didn't have the ability to write their name. They would prick their finger, put blood on the document, and use their thumb and leave a thumbprint because there was no other print the same as that one. It was sealed. How? With blood. They would know that. Yep, okay, it's been sealed. And he would go on and say, this is the blood of Christ that sealed it. And so for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and a scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. Wow, this is amazing. Because this document, this covenant, needed to bear you needed the witness of two. The document, the covenant, was one. And the person and people were the second one. Are you getting this today? And what did Moses do? The document or the will or the covenant was not binding until there was shedding of the blood. And what did he do? He sprinkled the blood on the document, which meant that something has died to bring this document into full effect with all this power. And not only did they do that as a witness, as a testator, as a will, but he sprinkled it on the people. Think of that. Now we have the two witnesses. Moses said, this is binding. It's written in the book. Do all of you people understand? Yes. Have you been here to hear it and see it? Yes. Now I seal it with the blood, both on the book 
and on you. And Moses was trying to show to them, it is now binding and full effect. Cannot be changed. I don't know how much you know about Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ, as our high priest, shed his blood. And it would be sprinkled on the mercy seat as a forgiveness. And the two cherubims that were represented on both sides would be the two witnesses, and God himself would be present. And it was sprinkled on the mercy seat as a binding picture for us that whoever will come into agreement with Jesus Christ you will receive the mercy of God. You will receive the truth of God's word. But also you will receive the covering of the blood of Christ. Now, isn't that amazing? Well, our time has gone by. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for what we can learn. What you're trying to show us through the whole area of the high priest, the mediator, the testator, Lord, the covenant. Oh, Lord, there is so much to share here that we as people, even myself, Lord, I don't even remember half of this in Bible school or anything that was talked about this. But, Lord, this is the big picture. This is what it's all about. This is why we can have faith in you that we just need to ask. We just need to come. We just need to receive because it's already been a bound document covered by your blood. Through your blood, Jesus and so we don't have to ask, is the word of God in full effect? It is in full effect because it's been sprinkled by the blood. It, we can become believers and disciples because we can be also sprinkled by the blood. Oh, Lord God, thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you teach us and show us from your word. May it encourage us today that whatever we may be faced, Whatever we may be struggling with, we are not under the old covenant anymore. We're under the new covenant and its power and its authority. And I thank you, Lord, that it is in the place of it is binding. And so, Father, that nothing could be changed. And, Lord, we don't want it changed. We thank you, Lord, that you are, uh, are, are never changing. You are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And Lord, I just thank you for that. So be with us now throughout this day and continue to encourage us. Continue to be with those who are not well, those who are struggling. Oh God, I pray that today, that maybe from what they hear, that they will call out upon you and say, Holy High Priest, oh, our Holy Mediator, Jesus Christ, thank you for your will and your testimony. Thank you, Lord, for the promise that comes with it and how you want to anoint us and empower us through the word, the living word. And so, Father, we give you thanks now for what you will do this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Wow. I don't know what you think, but feel free to comment. And uh, we love you. And I know I, I, I need to sit back in my chair for a while and just think about what the big picture of the God's wonderful scripture is all about. Amen. We love you. Keep on keeping on. And may the Lord guide you and direct you as you go forward this day. Amen. Bye-bye for now.